Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. We're very excited to talk today how HCA is using H2O in predicting patient outcomes in real time. So uh, I'm going to go through an introduction of HCA for those of you who aren't familiar with the company, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about our team and uh, where we sit within the company, and then discuss our data science pipeline, much of which will be uh, a review of some of the things that we've covered this morning and yesterday as well. And then I'm going to hand it over to Cody. He's going to talk about our architectures, our batch near real time, and then our real time infrastructure as well. And then we'll close it with a conversation around our uh, current POC. We're in one of our facilities right now uh, where we're utilizing this architecture. So HCA's mission is very simple. Above all else, we are committed to the care and improvement of human life. And HCA Hospital Corporation of America is, we're the leading healthcare provider in the country. We have 169 hospitals, 116 freestanding uh, surgery centers in 20 states, including the UK as well. And we have approximately 233,000 employees across the, the company. Um, we have over 6 million uh, patient encounters each year. We see more than 8 million emergency room visits, and we have about 2 million inpatients every year. But we're not just numbers. Our clients are our patients. So every day, we are, we're touching lives, we're improving families, um, we're improving patient care, and this gives you a breath of where we are across the company and the lives that we touch, the communities that we serve. And at this moment, I'd just like to again, pause and again, reiterate our, our mission at HCA, improving patient care and, and saving lives, and how H2O really plays um, a part in, in that whole schema. So we're able to build complex, sophisticated models, highly specific, sensitive models. Um, and then with H2O, we can do that and also take those models to, to the bedside. So we have 2 million patients that we see each year in patients, and we can affect change today. We can improve those patients that we're seeing right now in our hospitals and, and improve the nursing and, and doctor workflows as well. So thank you, Shri and team. And we also have a very talented team back at home base in Nashville. So our team of data scientists and uh, our, our, our product team as well, um, very, very talented group of individuals, uh, wide breadth of backgrounds. We have engineers, of course, people with backgrounds in statistics and math, um, detection anomaly experience. Uh, being in Nashville, we have uh, a few musicians on the team as well, and we're really led um, by our, our amazing leaders, uh, Dr. Jackson and Dr. Spencer Smith. So I want to give props to those individuals as well because they make everything possible. So with that, um, I'd like to review again some of what we've seen prior. We've seen this represented in a few different ways. So this is really how we like to begin the conversation around data science, when we talk about what kinds of questions data science can answer and how data science is really different from traditional statistics. So we begin by sitting down with our stakeholders and our, our clinical owners and really trying to drive home how important it is to ask the right questions. And we want to get through this cycle as quickly as possible because we, we like to go back and forth quite a bit. And you can see all the different the lines and arrows here because oftentimes we, we define the problems, we, we do some data sourcing, and then we may not see what we anticipated in the data. We have to go back, redefine the problem, uh, moving forward with data manipulation. But really, we want to ask the right questions, uh, get, get the data out that we can, and then test those hypotheses. So again, first step, we ask our stakeholders, our, our business owners, what business or clinical decisions will you make with the results of this analysis? And that's very challenging sometimes. We spend a lot of time in the beginning really making sure that we, we understand what the question is so that we can, we can communicate that to our facilities. Documenting all of our, our projects and product features in GitHub and on our timelines and code is very, is very important as well. And then we do all of our historical data sourcing for our testing and training data sets, Teradata SQL. Um, we, we log all of our, our uh, sourcing uh, data extracts and, and that whole pipeline using Drake. We're pulling from several different databases, and so we, we, we keep track of all those dependencies. And then the strides that we've really made just within the last year are incorporating the continuous integration pieces and continuously monitoring our, pro uh, monitoring our processes. And that's what Cody will speak to in just a few moments. 
So as far as data manipulation, we, we pretty much leave it open to um, whatever is most comfortable to the particular data scientist that's working on, on this piece on the project. So um, we have quite a few R developers and then some, some Python programmers. And uh, we do a lot of beginning visualization in Tableau and then also use H2O for some of that as well. And we're, we're moving into this, this real-time um, architecture and doing some of the feature engineering and data manipulation in Clojure, which allows allows that transition to real time to be much more seamless. So um, prior, to our, prior to doing our modeling, balancing, pre-processing, engineering features, and uh, removing any non-data. And, and in doing this, we're continuously speaking to, to the clinicians and our stakeholders because we want to make sure that we're representing the dependencies that they may anticipate um, in our models. So what kinds of medications are of interest? What kinds of, of medication interactions should we be considering and interactions between different vitals? Uh, the majority of our modeling we do on our analytic server, 64 cores, uh, 4 terabytes of, of hard disk. And this allows us to quickly iterate through models and, and evaluate our statistics quickly. And so we get to this point, and we're able to do our review and possibly consider redefining the question. So again, going back to the beginning, uh, are, we, are we asking the right questions? And do we need to do additional data sourcing? Uh, do we need to do additional data uh, feature engineering? and uh, consider additional features. And so that's where we may come back to the modeling and data sourcing piece. But what now, right? So we've effectively, efficiently built, uh, engineered clinically, statistically relevant features, thousands of features in our models. And we can build these accurate and complex models, highly sensitive, specific, accurate. But how do we get them to the patient bedside? And that's where H2O comes into play. And with that, I'll turn it over to Cody. Thanks, Allison. Mm -hmm. So the answer to this last question uh, is, is actually, um, I approach it from a couple perspectives. So I came from biomedical engineering undergrad and then data science and learned the process. And uh, now I support a team who's building these products, building uh, the delivery mechanisms. And Really, when, when you need to go deploy something um, and you need to teach, I, I really appreciated Tony's talk yesterday about bringing machine learning and predictive output to the workflow. And I think it, I think it turns into uh, a, a workflow integration and a user experience uh, design problem at that point once you have a, once you have a nice model. So what are some of the problems we're actually trying to solve? Um, you know, the, the, the business model is hospital operations, but you can't have a successful business model without quality care, right? And then megatrends in, in healthcare are pointing towards value-based purchasing, and, and there's a lot more incentives for reducing the high-level metrics of mortality and readmissions and those things. Um, I spend a lot of time, because, because I'm trying to approach this from a user experience problem, I spend a lot of time trying to think, or, or trying, yeah, trying to think like a doctor, like a clinician. Um, how do they work? And one of the things that I've, I've started to realize is uh, clinicians think probabilistically. Uh, if, if you know a, a doctor or a nurse, and you ask them a clinical question, what answer do you get back? It depends. They, uh, they want more information. They're constantly taking in new information and thinking about the, uh, the way to diagnose or um, uh, otherwise come to a clinical decision. Uh, and it makes sense, right? Because the, the systems physiology approach to understanding medicine is that <clears throat> you have cells, tissues, organs, they're all interacting with each other. There's feedback loops and cascades and all of these things happening. Uh, your body's responding to external stimulus. There's um, underneath, you know, the, the mechanics of, of medicine are pretty cool. So I think, uh, I think clinicians spend a lot of time under, trying to understand what went wrong in a system in order to diagnose and provide treatment. And, um, 
So I think that lends itself well to uh, machine learning, because when you talk to a doctor and, and you ask them a question about uh, how would you diagnose this, they often say it depends, and then they start telling you, well, if I see this, I would do this. If I see that, I would do that. Those are your features. Those are things that you can take and extract from the data and run with and start modeling against and see if, based on the, the hundreds of thousands of, of clinical records we have access to, is this repeatable? Are there patterns that we can pull out? So, uh, so it's, a, it's a fun challenge. Uh, and then I'm going to go into kind of what our... Oops. Uh, how, how do we actually do this? So how, how does our architecture look, and how are, we how are we building and taking these models that we create and putting them into production? So here is, uh, we'll start with the data source. And uh, we've evolved in our, in our ability to source data as a company. We started a, a, a large-scale warehousing process in 2011. We had about a 48-hour latency in the time someone entered something into the electronic health record till the time it was uh, available to us. We've reduced that significantly uh, and, and gone through phases where we've enhanced ETL and even gone uh, to great lengths to extract data quicker. Um, our latest is a, kind of a message-based data source where we can extract data right off the HL7 messages that are transferred between modules in the EHR. Uh, excuse me. So for, for near real time, uh, one back a second, this extract on demand piece, it's very narrow in scope, and we have to hit the production uh, electronic health record. So we're willing to take that risk uh, from an infrastructure standpoint if it's, if it's worth it. But it's very limited use case. We can't, we can't just hammer the production system. The message-based stuff is more passive, so we can get that easily. So we have a data source. Obviously, everyone knows what the scoring engine is and a user interface. Uh, as we're learning to cr crawl, walk, run with the clinical workflow integration, um, H2O is really keeping up nicely. I mean, we can plug it in in multiple places, and I'll show you an architecture slide next. But the idea is we can show early value by building an MVP, showing it to clinicians, seeing how they react, uh, and and advance the clinical workflow integration agenda, solve those problems while we also create our, our real-time systems. So it's nice to have that option and, and be able to deploy H2O in different ways. So here's a slide. We'll start at the, uh, the top left. That's where we are now. And we have bits and pieces of, of the real-time system, but we'll start with near real-time. So OpenGate, like I said, extracts data from the electronic health record. That's where all your vitals, all of your lab results, all of your uh, clinical orders are stored. And uh, it gets dropped into a database. And then we have a couple processes that happen. One is we have a prediction model, um, a predictive model workflow. So our, our teams like Clojure. Um, it's a functional language. And uh, we've been trying to train as many data scientists on how to use it uh, so that we can have a comprehensive feature engineering library and build in all the nice software engineering um, design principles that we want. We ETL some other stuff around that and land it in an analytics store. The user interface uh, drives off of that, and we have some active and, and uh, batch-oriented processes happening there. So the key characteristics are that uh, our data source updates about every 15 minutes, and then we can provide a new score in our real-time system, next phase, uh, we have a Kafka topic approach where HL7, these are these arcane, long uh, pipe and hat delimited uh, messages. And we have to pull out the necessary information via, via some custom stuff and then publish um, you know, cleaned up data to another topic. Again, the same, the same uh, closure feature engineering and then subsequent scoring. So we pulled the, the POJO in as a dependency, and we use, that, we use it that way. The same thing that helped us advance the clinical agenda there is also helping us here. So we can reuse components. We don't have to re-engineer that as we switch out our data source. So it's, again, really flexible. I'll skip this real quick, because we're running out of time. Um, but uh, our, real quick on our delivery model, so developers 
write code, we check it into GitHub. Jenkins helps us out by running tests in, a, in an environment on Docker. And then we can deploy things to Nexus. So that's where we store all of our um, compiled artifacts. And we deploy them. And uh, you know, we run the user interface with Node.js. And we hit some different data sources uh, with that. So I think we're about out of time. Uh, Real quick, do you want to wrap up? Sure. 10 seconds. Yes. Yeah, so um, currently, we've uh, completed one POC, and we're running a second at another facility. And we have a few different goals. So we really start by um, assessing the clinical workflow that's currently in place, looking at those processes. And then from there, we, we see how uh, capable the model is to extract meaningful information from that and then determine how useful the prediction would be or is in that process. And then once we, we, we've, uh, we've started, so that's sort of in more of a pre-phase POC. And then while we're uh, working with the facility, then we're able to incorporate their feedback, improve the model, and really maximize the utility of the prediction tool. So at the end of the day, again, um, changing, uh, improving healthcare and, and saving lives. So. With that, I think we're out of, out of time. But if you do have any questions, please feel free to see Cody or myself. We'll be here all afternoon. Thank you so much.